Good morning and welcome to the next in our Family Business Series um, as part of the Family Business Summit 2020. This morning we're looking at succession but also succession from the building of a leadership team and planning for the future to help future-proof a family firm with the right people in the right seats uh, to drive the business forward. I'm delighted to be joined by Chairman of Saxton Banfield, who is also one of the founders um, of the business, Stephen. Um, so Stephen, without further ado, let me hand over to you to make an introduction and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the chance to join you today. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. We're delighted to be sponsoring this year's Family Business Summit. I congratulate you, Paul, on putting together such an interesting bunch of sessions. Um, at Saxon Bone Club, we're passionate about family-owned businesses, and when I'm asked why, I usually talk about the values, the culture, and the longer-term planning horizons. So we're delighted to be involved. Next slide, Paul, if you would, please. So I'll start with a bit about our firm, just adding to what Paul said in the introduction. I founded Saxton Banfield along with my now late, uh, sadly, business partner, Anthony Saxton in 1986. Uh, makes us one of the longest established independent such firms. And since then, we've developed a reputation as trusted advisors across a range of sectors. So we work in the commercial, public, and not-for-profit spaces here and abroad. And in 2014, um, having established with my children, they didn't want it to be a family business, interestingly enough, I took the decision to take the business into employee ownership. We now have over 70 partners and our ownership structure, we think, is a defining aspect of who we are. As the first employee owned search firm, we th think we have a personal understanding of the way different operating and ownership models impact on a business and the need to identify candidates who appreciate those sensitivities. And we've been lucky enough to work with some amazing family businesses, some in the very early stages and some older than the Bank of England. And we have a specific practice dedicated to family businesses. Next slide, please, Paul. Uh, while we recognize that family businesses have many of the same challenges as non-family businesses, we also believe their sense of longevity, the values, the stewardship that underpins family businesses and needs resonates with the leaders. Family businesses also face unique challenges, such as knowing when and how to bring in external talent while still developing your internal family members, thinking about succession and how to maintain the values and the ethos of business while ensuring you're forward-looking and competitive. Easy, eh? So this morning, I'm going to speak about succeeding in family business. Part of that advice is based on all the businesses I've worked with over the years. And I will also refer to this piece of research we carried out where we published a thought piece entitled Tomorrow's Legacy. We spoke with some 26 executives and non-execs from family businesses across many sectors, from across the UK and some international. We ensured we had a balance of family and non-family perspectives. And the focus of our questioning was on challenges and opportunities facing family businesses as they look to the future. And the emphasis on an approach towards succession planning and the consideration of the practicalities of introducing and integrating non-family leaders. And we were obviously also interested in where this had screwed up, frankly, because you can learn from errors as well as successes. Next slide, please, Paul. So today I'll cover five key issues that I think are important to family businesses. The first is succession, never too early to think about it. The second is advice. Third, when to make an external hire. Fourth, once you bring in somebody externally, how do you do it successfully? And then let's talk about the alignment of values. Um, and we've got a little tweak on that about some psychological work we've been doing that allows you to almost measure it. Next slide, please, on succession, Paul. Thank you. So succession planning differs from organization to organization, but when the added element of family is thrown in the mix, it requires additional considerations. It's never too early, in my experience, to think about succession, but often in family businesses, the conversations are delayed because they might bring up uncomfortable and personally very difficult topics. I mean, if your biggest problem is your father, um, it's not just a Star Wars issue, it's something you need to address within the firm. The world is a much bigger, more accessible place, and this means that the default of staying at home to work in the family business is not as appealing to everyone as it once was. 
However, the earlier succession planning starts, the more options will be available when the time comes. It's important to start encouraging interest in gazing aspirations with younger generations early on. I think if the function of a leader is to be scanning the horizon for lots of things that change, one of the things a family leader needs to do is to be scanning the wider generations of the family to see if talent is emerging and coming through. If the children are going to become shareholders for the future, it's important for them to understand how the business works and by getting them involved, establishing whether they have a personal interest in it and you can avoid some difficult conversations later. It's not always an easy task, especially as the shareholder group grows. And if you're 300 years old as a business, believe me, the shareholder group goes on to infinity. We've seen this done in interesting ways, such as developing an internship scheme, holding regular gatherings for younger members of the family to interact and learn about it. When you've established there is an interest from the next generation, uh, some families just stop at that point, but I think it's important to address their development as you would any other member of staff. Make sure you've got a plan in place that means they're in the strongest possible position to lead the business when the time comes. I think it can be really, really hard to be objective when considering areas that need development for a family member in the same way as it can with non-family members. And uh, that's a point where you might well want to bring in an external view, whether from somebody such as us or whether from your non-executives, if you have some. Another issue can be the outgoing generation who may present the greatest challenge to succession planning. If you have what we call a resistant exeter who doesn't want to relinquish control, this can be a challenge to ensuring a smooth transition. And in this, in this instance, you need a sensitive and open approach often best served by an outside facilitator who's seen as independent and less emotionally involved. And ensuring control is handed over in a smooth way will allow the next generation to advance and develop the organization in their own way. Next slide, please, Paul, on advice. Seeking advice from other organizations can be a powerful tool. Seeking what they've done well is of course helpful but also hearing what other organizations haven't done well and the mistakes they've made can be even more powerful. It's something that bringing families together as this summit does is a key part of things like that. Engaging with other families and businesses to understand how they've managed their transition processes can provide a good template and challenge you to break your own traditions. One of the things that we love doing is bringing leaders of family businesses together, usually over a small quiet group with Chatham House rules and see them learn from each other. It's wonderful. So when I decided to take Saxton Bamfar to employee ownership, I reached out to people in businesses who'd already done this, and I was surprised how ready people are to give advice. In fact, people are evangelical about it. And I think in the family business sector, we often hear a willingness from our clients like to provide advice to other businesses as they want to see success for family businesses going on. Mentoring and coaching can be helpful, can provide a different view when somebody's not in the business. And for us, working with family businesses, we're often brought in to provide assessment and help benchmark, is the family member as good as you might be able to recruit against the market? And this can be particularly helpful in thinking about the development of the next generation. Next slide, please, Paul. How to make an external hire. Let's talk about that. The introduction of a non-family member into a business can be a positive thing when done well. And often this is done to achieve a balance. For example, if the chairman of the business is a family member, then the MD or the CEO may be non-family or vice versa. A mix of family and non-family on boards can be particularly helpful to ensure there's a good level of governance and the right skill sets around the table to succeed. One of my homespun tips is always have at least two outside non-executive directors rather than just one, because being one can be the loneliest place you can imagine. Being able to separate family and business decision making is fundamental and to have a mix around the table of family and non-family can help with that. When thinking about bringing someone into the business at any level, it's important to be clear with yourself about how and where the leader will add to your value, value to your business. Define the opportunity as you would with an investment at a strategic and operational level. Shape the candidate profile you're looking to identify and set the tone of conversations with the candidate at each stage. 
One of the hardest things is making sure that all the family members who no doubt will want to meet a potential incoming leader understand and are in agreement with this. This is to ensure you have clear expectations so that whoever you bring in isn't expected by all the family to be Superman or Wonder Woman and solve every problem. And from the beginning, you need to be, understand what the family will learn from the appointee. And then you can think about onboarding. It's often a good time also to think about the introduction, if you don't have one, of a family charter or constitution. Because um, you've got to balance the concerns that bringing in an outsider might lead to a permanent shift away from family rather than reinforcing it. Creating some structure can find reassurances and reference points to make sure the family voices know they're always going to be heard. Next slide please, Paul. How to make an external hire. Once you've made the decision to hire, how do you do this successfully? Uh, first of all, chemistry is king. Make sure you invest time to share and articulate the key markers of your organizational culture. Skill set can develop and evolve, but being attuned to the organization's innate values can't be learned. You can teach the skill, you can't teach the will. Make sure you're comfortable with the candidate's alignment to your values, culture, and the heritage and ambition of your business. And on the slide, I'm not gonna explore every single one here, but on the slide, we've put five questions um, to think for the non-family member to ask as they're thinking about joining the business. It's as tough for them coming to get to know you as it is for you to get to know them. Explore the business and family ambitions carefully as part of that process. The candidates need to develop a clear picture of the business, the leaders, the ambition. We recommend you spend time with candidates way beyond the interview, getting to know them, allowing them to meet people across the business. It helps create the organizational culture at the very beginning. Family businesses aren't for every candidate. Uh, you need somebody who can be honest about whether they're happy to work in that organization that might take a longer term view and whether this ownership structure aligns with their own ambitions. The shorthand I like to use is that you need a CEO who understands that it is not his train set or her train set. The organization belongs to the family, they are there to help. The next slide, please, Paul. And the key thing I think is the alignment of values and between family and non-family. Family businesses often known for their commitment to community values, to long-term views. And this is, seems to me to have been a real strength in our current climate. The pandemic has meant many businesses are struggling. And in the face of this often values have been tested. But in a crisis, people notice when companies have added their values. And that is rarely rewarded by members of staff or by consumers or clients. Ensuring there's an alignment in values between the family members and the non-family members is fundamental. Now you may feel that the values of the business are obvious to everyone working in it, but this isn't always the case. Uh, we recommend you spend time deciding what they are and literally write them down. We have ours written on the wall in reception for everyone to see when they walk into the office. Uh, that's external guests as well as internal people. Anyone joining the business externally can then self-select out of joining you if these values don't fit their own. And having them written down can be helpful in the hiring process as it makes it easier for you to articulate what matters to you. Your values are likely to reflect your heritage as a business. That's a good thing, but there's the need to balance respecting tradition and trust and being open-minded. Understanding why decisions were made in the past is useful uh, but don't get stuck in family conversations that say, that's how we've always done things around here. The values may shift from one generation to another, and that may be a good thing. In our experience, getting this value alignment right is the biggest marker for success. And one of the things we have worked on over the years is some particular psychological tools um, that you can use in advance. It's not perfect but it takes you a step down the road of seeing if somebody is gonna fit. So I'll end my presentation there by thanking you all for listening. As I said at the starter, we're passionate about a firm, as a firm about family businesses, recognizing their additional focus on values, on culture and the longer term. And I hope that this will all prove helpful for you as you think about your own businesses for the future. Back to you, Paul. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak.
Thanks, Stephen. That was um, that was really interesting. Let me just stop the share. Um, I guess the first question I've got for you really is one of the first things you said was that you need to start a conversation and it all starts with a conversation. Um, yeah. And we all know that, that families are entrenched in, in heritage and history, especially some of the long standing ones. What advice would you have to the audience in terms of, of starting that conversation? I think it's, in my view, it's often started by uh, a son or a daughter or a family member who is roughly speaking around 35 to 45. Mm -hmm. uh, who are beginning to think about the future. They're beginning to think about having some clarity as to where the business they've committed to is going. Um, and then I think there's two routes at that point. They can either have it directly with the, the larger element of the family that is typically above them in the organization. Um, if that's too hard, I think they should start thinking about reaching out for external help at that point. Um, I would say some of the time, I think we felt like family therapists. I remember having four uh, young CEOs round a table one evening, and uh, you know, all, I would say half the evening was taken up with uh, sibling rivalry questions. Um, they were all from different businesses, not their sibling rivalry, but they shared the same challenges uh, in each case. And I think, you know, I often think that there's a real value for a non for having a good non-executive. And the non-exec or the key special advisor, you know, can be helpful in facilitating that conversation. And you, you mentioned that the, the next gen being in the age of 35, 45, I guess that's where you talk about the next gen, or the successor might not come from the family down the line, but that's where you start to identify where they may or may not come from and then look, maybe look outside. Yeah. And also I think that those people may not have been being developed in the way that they should have been. You know, if it's just an assumption in that family business that somebody will come into it and take it over. You know, we'd never treat somebody we hired off the street like that. We'd want to know what their strengths and weaknesses were, where we needed to reinforce them, what courses we might send them on, what coaching they needed. And I find that that's often just not there in some family businesses. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with you. So it's the, almost like the professionalization of the recruitment process from a family um, or a family member, as you would do to the external market, isn't it? It's, it's making sure you, you use the same parameters and if not, possibly even use stronger parameters to make sure that the family member's got the right skills the business needs. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the professionalization of the development process once you've got them, once you've got your internal family members and the external ones, mm. you treat them on all fours to build a unified team together. What sort of indicators are there, um, Stephen, for you in terms of what you've seen over the years? What are the indicators that you would say within a family demonstrate the need to bring maybe somebody that is non-family to lead the business going forward? There must be some key flags. I think one of the key flags is you know, if, you are the, if you are in the family and you are in the business and you're finding you're having the same strategic conversation 10 times, time and again it will come up and nothing gets resolved in terms of how are we moving forward? Are we in the right markets? Should we be evolving? And I always like to remind people that you know, before Nokia came to be number one in smartphones, they made Wellington boots. You know, and that assumption of where your strategy is going to be for the future can take you in radically different directions. So I think if, the, if people talk about, talk to us about knocking their heads against the subject, you know, they want time and again to raise something and it just doesn't get resolved and it just doesn't get moved. Okay. And that's when you can tell you're stuck and something needs to happen to unstick it. And, 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 and when there are sticky moments like that, do you think family firms struggle with the thought of bringing in a non-family leader? Is it a kind of is, is it a thing they have to juggle with their head, the emotion, head over heart type, type conversation? Absolutely. And I think that they often have to have that strategy conversation first. So, um, you know, I, I, we have some wonderful partners in Helsinki and uh, uh, they do a two day, regularly do two day facilitation sessions uh, for family businesses that have got stuck on their strategy. And before you even think about it, do you even have the right person or not? It's against what criteria would you be looking? If you don't know where you're going, then any route will do. Whereas you need this clarity of where you want to get to. And from, from your perspective, Stephen, do you think that the family values and culture are attractive to a non-family uh, member that wants that, that may want to come and join you? Do you think it can be a barrier joining a family firm? Or is it more of a, once they understand the situation, it's definitely an advantage? I think it's a self-selecting, it's a selection criteria that rules some people out. Mm -hmm. um, if you, I think to be a successful leader, let's talk as we're bringing in a chief executive, you know, 
she needs to feel um, comfortable that it's not hers. She needs to feel comfortable in her own skin. Uh, she needs to feel happy working in a team. If you have the hard charging, uh, you know, I am the Messiah chief executive, that doesn't work in family businesses. It frankly doesn't work in many businesses either, but there are still lots of them around. And equally, if you have uh, the kind of equity assumption that some CEOs have, that they will always have a piece of the action, mm -hmm. uh, that can be incredibly disruptive if they start talking about that. Uh, they often won't talk about it before they join you, but they'll start talking about it after they've done something clever in the first year. And that can be quite difficult for the family to cope with, I think. An interesting point actually raised, and a question's come in for, from the audience saying, do non-family executives expect or demand a stake in ownership in shares um, to join and actually commit to joining the family firm? Do you see that on a, a regular basis? Well, I don't, I on the whole recommend families don't do that and unless they already have some external shareholding. Um, I think having phantom shares that can be bought back or as a version of an LTIP, um, but I think you'd have to be you have to be very comfortable that's the direction you want to take the family business in. I mean, I have seen the wrong kind of chief executive come in and ruin a family business that it then ends up getting sold uh, because they come in, they get equity, and then where's the market for that equity? And then this, that becomes an easy conversation then of would you realize we could all go external? And Now, if the family has a strategic decision that it wants to sell, that it wants to bring in external capital, then yes, bring in a chief executive, give them equity in it, and then they are motivated along with the family mm. in that way. But well, that's a strategic decision, isn't it, Stephen, in terms yeah. of they're looking to exit down the line, then bring in someone that can get the, the best value for you down the line and be, be good for everybody. But Correct, exactly. A lot, a lot, lots of the family businesses that we talk to are taking a long-term view. I mean, even now, talking to family firms that are making decisions for two months, five years, 10 years, 30 years down the line and the transition, so they're already planning long-term. So it would obviously take a certain mindset that can can mm. jump into a business and, and lead a business with that that framework around them. Mm. I mean, I think we, we're seeing um, a weariness at the moment amongst uh, publicly quoted executives um, for that world. I mean, the quarterly reporting in these pandemic times, it's become even more uh, irksome than before. So the idea of an ownership structure that can take a longer term view is hugely attractive, is hugely attractive. But it's important that you don't believe everything they say and you check it out. Yeah. They really are serious about that and not just tired of uh, running the city life. Yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely. What do you see as the biggest challenge for someone that comes into a family business? Where does it all go wrong? I think it goes wrong. Uh, Rejection from the body politic. I think if all the family aren't on board, yeah. Uh, if you go into uh, your first board meeting and there are six people around the table with the same surname, and only two of them were involved in your hiring, you probably know this. You may be in some trouble already because you may find the other four have a completely different view as to what should have been asked, what should have been done. Um, so I think that sense of collective responsibility for the success is the really the key thing. I'm only smiling, Stephen, because I've been there. So um, yes, I, I've, I've been in the room. Um, I was recruited to be the managing director of a family firm by the chairman, um, and then faced all sorts of political angst and, and, and difficult conversations. I mean, it didn't last that long, and it was all the things you were describing were just not right. So in hindsight, maybe I should have asked different questions before joining. But actually, it, it's, it's tricky sometimes to get the truth before you sit down behind the desk and actually listen and see what's going on. It's very tricky, and we certainly take it as our responsibility if we're involved to work long enough with the family so at least we're satisfied that there's enough unanimity of view. You know, if we say, can we talk to Aunt Sarah and Uncle Frank, and the answer is no, but you find they're still on the board, then that raises all sorts of red flags for us. So. Yeah, no, that's good advice, actually. Um, obviously, the, the whole discussion around strengthening the board, changing a CEO, changing the leader, has emotional consequences for a family because as a family member that is then exiting or being asked to change their role um hugely difficult conversations to have but how do you you mentioned the reluctant exiteer how do you engage with those people to try and help make the transition from family to non-family leader more successful or given more chance for success i think it is tough uh, people often have um, 
many leaders of businesses have so much of their own self-identity bound up in their business anyway. And if you're a family leader of a family business, even more so, that your sense of who you are in the, in the universe um, can be entirely bound up in that business world. So I think it's one of the ways through that is to deal with that person as an individual human being and try and establish some go-to place rather than a go-from place. What are they going to do with the rest of their lives? Uh, I'm a great believer in reinvention at any age and encouraging people to see what else they might do. Often they've never thought of anything outside of their own family business. It might be a family foundation, doing more charitable and community work. It might be taking their skills into, a lo into local organizations, or it might be something completely different. I have a, a, a guy who was chief executive of a very major business, uh, retrained as a plumber and electrician. Um, and um, his, his family business was not in that, it was in insurance. So, he, and he now has a very happy life being self-employed and um, able to do a bit of plumbing and a bit of electrics. Uh, now, you would never have thought of that two or three years before, but starting to explore with him, you know, what was important to him going forward. And it was about meeting people, different people each day. And then you start to think, well, one of the other things I like to explore with people is what, um, what did they want to be when they were 13, 14, and never got round to. And that reinvention phase can often be a chance to look at that as well. Mm. We also see quite a lot of, um, of business owners that step back, but take on more of an ambassador or a presidential role and, and are given a title, which kind of gives them that, that, that status that they, they would they, they fear losing. And that, that can work quite well, but I guess it goes back to what you were saying about governance and having the right governance to make sure that the, the yes. role is clearly defined and it doesn't become like that meddler, a meddling seagull that keeps coming in a, 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 and causing angst within, within the business. Yeah, absolutely. I think governance is, is crucial. Uh, uh, I, and getting it right is not easy. So I remember once uh, meeting the board of a family business and it all felt perfectly normal until you found out that there was in fact a whole nother board that was only had family members um, and they took most of the decisions. You know, superficially it looked like there was a fully functioning, well-governed board, but actually they didn't really decide you know, whether to have coffee or tea, it was all done elsewhere. Yeah, I've seen that before too. Another question coming in today is, what supports do family managers need over and above those that provided for just, just normal uh, management within the business? So what, what extra steps should be in place to help the family managers? Uh, what development kind of supports? Is that mm, the yeah. Uh, I think the hardest thing is, is to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the family members. I think they have to work harder at that. Um, we, we tend to be either tougher or not tough enough on members of our own family. Yeah. And I think judging that right, because if you start with that, then you can define what development needs somebody needs. Uh, I think the thing, what do I say most common thing? I think it's people skills. Um, I think it's not case in every case, but some family businesses mean the sons and daughters have grown up in reasonable comfort or semi-prosperity and may not actually have the empathy for the factory floor or the workplace um, that they, their fathers or mothers would have had. So I think people skills, I would say, is the key thing that we most often need to develop. Mm. And, and, and how important is culture? You mentioned culture at the very beginning. Mm. Um, a lot of the next gen now will leave the business and go off and follow a career in, in, in a different sector, maybe travel and then come back and bring new skills back, which is great for the business. But how mm. important is it that that cultural fit isn't lost along the way? Well, I think culture trumps strategy uh, any day of the week. And I think you have to have a cultural fit. Now, I think cultures can evolve, uh, but I think having a consciousness at the most top level of the organization of what the culture is, is in fact, you know, having almost, if you like, a culture czar. I mean, I see one of my roles as chairman to be the culture czar for the organization. Um, what's working, what's not working in that. And um, we've got some very fancy psychological stuff we can, you know, if, uh, I it take longer, Paul, but, you know, that I've got a very good psychologist who, from Sweden, who believes that the culture of an organisation, uh, in Freudian terms, is a product of the superego and the id of the founders and leaders. 
and I think it's quite interesting. <laughs> and we might not have time for that this morning, but that's something I'd love to explore at some point. Yeah, no, we'll take longer on that another time. That's a really good one. Uh, but it, he would recognize that that can evolve as successive generations of leaders come in. I think it's important that if somebody has, got, as you say, done their traveling, gone off to work in the States or something like that, um, the re-entry program, bring in, you can't just bring them back in and plump them in and leave them alone. There needs to be a re-entry program for them to educate themselves on where the business has been and grown while they've been away, and also for them to share explicitly what it is they think they've learned. Um, and the more that can be explicit, the more you avoid the, um, the traffic accident of them coming in and saying, well, this is what we did at GE in Boston, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I guess that, 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 that's, that's always the challenge, isn't it? And the other question I've got for you then is along the same sort of lines, but obviously business is changing a lot at the moment. There's been a lot of change, rapid change in the last, last three, four, five months. Um, the, the need and skills of a business leader has changed phenomenally over the last 20 years. So are you seeing businesses take the next step and actually looking at what the, the skills are needed of the next leader, CEO of the business, or are they just looking at the skills of the current generation and think that there's a fit? And, and is there a disconnect between the position now and what the business may need from a leader in five, 10 years time? I think the most thoughtful of um, particularly chairs and boards are, I mean, when at the beginning, during lockdown, you're up to your neck in muck and bullets and you've got to survive. Yeah. A number of organizations have set up, if you like, skunk work groups to think about what are the future things that we can take, what do we want to take with us out of the lockdown and what do we want to leave behind? And I think part of that has been to start to identify different shapes of skill sets around the board table. And they could hardly any, I hardly talk to a client these days that doesn't want more digital capability on their board table. As everything has shifted to be online, people have realized that they have uh, an analog board for a digital world. And moving away from that is, is, is been the key thing, I think, that we get asked for. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with you, actually. I think that the, 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 the digital world is definitely here to stay. And I think that's one of the, yeah. you, you talked a little bit about the skill set and, and the market being a good opportunity now to, to recruit people in to, to, to strengthen mm -hmm. the, the team. Um, mm -hmm. Just, just taking the role of chairman of the board. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really serious role. It's a significant role in any business. Mm. Do you think families engage in enough training for their chairs so that their chairs are fully aware of their role and responsibility and how to actually become a good chair of a family firm? No, I don't. I would say I see more cases where um, it just becomes, you know, father's turn as, you know, as, as people move up or mother's turn. Um, I don't see them thinking that, and I don't, I don't think that in, they, enough time is spent in getting them to realize that the chair can be the horizon scanner. As I'm saying, I think horizon scanning is a very important part of it. A yeah. Part of that is where is this business going? Where is the family going? What do we need on that? Um, and I think every chair, everybody becomes chair of a family business should say, do I have the right board? Uh, I'm a strong believer that if you can have one or two non-executive directors, it really helps a lot. Yeah. It really helps a lot. and helps you from just consuming your own uh, rhetoric all the time. Yeah. yeah, it just brings some freshness, doesn't it, to the whole conversation? Yes. Yeah, some divergence. Another question here from, from another, another panellist here is, um, how can returning family members assess if they are actually bringing back any value to add value to the family firm? A great question. Mm. Um, I, well, I think this question of articulating what it is they think they've learned. Now, I know we don't always know. We don't always know ourselves well enough to know what it is that we've learned. Uh, but I think treating coming back as if you were a new joiner and uh, having what you know, we would call an onboarding program, yeah. perhaps working with an external coach for three to six months um, with regular reflection can help bring out what it is you do uh, bring back. And I think part of what would be going on there is that in those early days, um, you, you can, the, the coach can ask you what it is you think you're noticing. I'm a, I'm a, another part of my life, I'm a Benedictine and a great believer in the rule of St. Benedict. And Benedict says you should always listen to the youngest monk. And that is largely because they come in and go, why are you doing that? And I think that sense of getting the returning family member to reflect on what it is they're actually noticing 
And they may be noticing things about the way the business runs and the culture and the values and the strategy that they didn't notice before they went away. And capture that in the first three to six months because it'll be gone after six months. They will be reabsorbed yeah. if it's not captured. Really good advice there, actually. Um, and then another question which is interesting, and it's not something I've heard of before, but a question coming and saying, do you think potential external leaders should be asked to conduct a role, almost like an induction role or a, a short-term role prior to stepping up to the top job? I think there are advantages of that are that the family feels they're getting to know them. Um, the downside to it is uh, it's a bit like trying to be half pregnant. I mean, are you recruiting them to lead or are you not recruiting them to lead? And I think a bit of a it is that you can hire a better person to be CEO than you can hire to be the strategy director and we may make you chief executive. So I think that you know, it, it, it's, it feels like it's a safe thing to do. I think it could be quite an unsafe thing to do on some occasions. I'd prefer to see more detailed referencing on them, more detailed psychological work done on them um, to come in and do the proper role straight away. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think it's almost like you're dangling a carrot and, and, and having been in the same scenario before, I think it's really easy to overpromise, bring yeah. someone in into a, into a more junior role and then that role never quite materializes. As you said before, the, the reluctant exeter just, just stays around forever yeah. and ever and ever and it just becomes a, a, a kind of a, an even bigger mess than it could have been in the first place. Exactly. Um, if you could give one piece of advice just to kind of wrap up this morning, which has been a fantastic insight for me actually, but if you could give one piece of advice to maybe a next generation that's, that's just joining their board in terms of how they can broaden their skills and add value and plan for the future, what would that be? I think the one piece of advice I would give would be to reach out to others um, in your position in other firms. Um, form a network, form a network of friends. And um, as I say, I've, I've, for many, many years now, I've, I've brought young chief executives or young potential successor chief executives together. And you can just see them learning from each other in such a deep, deep way. And able to, it's also quite therapeutic, as I say, when you start talking about some of these things, but that shared and different experience. So reach out for others who will travel with you on that journey. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that too, actually, in terms of we've done peer group sessions this year with CEOs, but actually peer groups with, with the next generation that are considering them on the same journey, they yeah. often think they're alone, don't they? they and do. they're, they're not alone, there are lots of people in the same situation, so to, to learn from your network. Absolutely, absolutely. Stephen, well, we have a copy of your research on the website, so I will make sure that's readily available to the delegates after today. Um, okay. Thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, finally meeting you. Um, it's great. It's a, it's, it's a big topic, and I know you're doing some fantastic things with some fantastic family firms around the UK. Um, I think it's, I just got to end with it. I think it's a Jim Collins quote, and I've used it a lot recently, but in terms of strengthening your board, isn't it? It's all about getting the right people in the right seats um, on the bus to drive your business forward and not just getting people on the bus. So, Correct. so, absolutely. Um, family firms need to Family firms need to listen to your, the, the words that you're saying because it's, it's sound advice for all of them to link their governance to their recruitment and to their strategy and also tie it into cultural values. So Stephen, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure meeting you. And, um, thank you, Paul. Thanks for all you do too. Goodbye now. You're welcome. Thank you very much.